You're listening to Listening to Books and Bobo, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Murray Bernier. And my name is Rira Yu. And welcome to a special episode of Books and Bobo. On this episode, we talk to author Henry Lian, the author and creator of the Peace Brought Chen series. Um, the second book just came out in January, and it's an amazing middle grade series um, featuring uh, Peace Brought Chen, who is a new student at a school specializing in martial arts. And figure skating, yes, Wu Lu, <laughs> which is um, which is something that is specifically engineered for Reba sensibilities. Yes, yes. Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> so, without further ado, uh, here is our conversation with Henry Lian. And we're here with author Henry Lian for this interview with Books and Boba. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Hi. Yay. Glad to be here. <laughs> fan of your podcast. Thank you. We're a fan of you. I was just telling Henry that um, I actually bought one of his books to give to my niece because um, I want her to read more Asian American authors. So. <laughs> Yay. We first heard about your book through uh, Fonda Lee, who is also Fonda. on this, who is also on this podcast, and we had asked her uh, what books she was reading, and she was just raving about your book. And uh, the minute I heard the premise, she said, "Oh, figure skating mixed with m- mixed with martial arts." I was like, "What? Like, I <laughs> like I need to read this immediately." Um, so I'm re- really, really excited to have you uh, here on the show. Um, I guess just to start off, where are you from? I am from Taiwan. I was I was born in Taiwan in 1970, back when the earth was still green and dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> and I came over when I was very young in 1974 to California and uh, spent, I, I spent my childhood here in California, Southern California, went back east for uh, boarding school and, and uh, college and came back for law school and never left. Oh, so you you have a background in law then? I do have a background in law and I use it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like a lot of uh, authors that I like used to be lawyers and they really honed their craft through um, through being lawyers because you have to like write a lot of <laughs> like dissertations, I guess. Well, I mean, yeah, you, words are your weapon when you are an attorney. But the other thing that's very useful for me as a writer and sp- specifically as a world builder, is I'm not afraid of research. And Mm -hmm. as an attorney, you're constantly doing research. That's probably 70, 80% of your job. Understanding that the information that you need is out there and you need to curate that information with diving into research. So that was invaluable as a world builder. Um, the, the, The comfort with words also... But um, the ability to research and the lack of fear of research was the most valuable thing for me as a writer. Yeah. So uh, when did you know that you were a writer? Like, did you catch the writing bug when you were young? Did you write fiction? I caught that. I did, but I caught a lot of bugs. (laughs) (laughs) And I didn't really pursue anything seriously until I was middle-aged. I had had three career choices at the end of college, law school, business school, medical school, uh, that would be funded (laughs) by my parents, at least partially. Not that they had a lot of money, but they would help out. And so I, I, I figured out I figured that law would probably be the most uh, plastic of those three professional Mm -hmm. uh, skills that I could learn. And it has proven to be. And I love being a lawyer, actually. I was a good lawyer. I I had a lot of fun and I felt like I did good work. I was one of the, I was one of the good guys, but (laughs) I I had to do a career change, not by my own choice, but because life circumstances happened to me. And so I ended up um, leaving the law, but never leaving the skills behind that I learned. Mm. So uh, the New York Times describes Peace Sprout Chen as it's Hermione Granger meets Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon meets The Ice Capades meets Mean Girls. Do you think this is an apt description for your book? It is on the surface level, on the plot level. It absolutely is. And it's the kind of thing that we that no publicity could have bought. I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> it's golden in terms of placing, orienting the reader by um, quoting particular things that are in the book plot-wise. It is about kung fu figure skating. It is about a very talented and headstrong female main character. It is a boarding school story. And it is about bullying and it is about peer pressure. So it hits a lot of those things. But it's about 
more than that. Um, it's also about immig- immigration. Mm-hmm. It's about girl yeah. power. It's about teamwork. It's about leadership. It's about divided national identity. Um, what happens when you are an immigrant and your home homeland goes to war with your new country? So all of those things are in the book as well. But the cornerstone description from the New York Times is accurate on uh, a plot level. Uh, and on I am the premise, very, I, yeah. yeah. I am very grateful for that. I have no <laughs> complaints for that description. So I really want to talk about uh, Wu Liu, uh, the art of the martial arts of, of figure skating mixed in with Kung Fu. Yes. Uh, where did you get the concept for it? And were you always interested in both sports? I don't have a noble answer to that. <laughs> the answer to that honestly, is that I was just interested in figure skating because it was the Winter Olympics at the time, and I got very easily sucked into all of the drama and narrative. Was this the 2014 Uh, No, no, this was before that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And and so I was very into figure skating at the time, and I also was very into kung fu movies, particularly art house kung fu movies, particularly Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Hero, and um, House of Flying Daggers. Those three rocked my world so hard that I've never gotten over it. So uh, those were in my mind at the time. And then also architecture. Architecture has been a lifelong obsession of mine, and I I was and will always be interested in architecture. So I just honestly mashed together all the things I was interested in into, in, into one convenient place and then gave it an anime soul. And <laughs> an anime um, soul. <laughs> that's really the genesis of the idea. But I had done this to create my own private Disneyland for my own enjoyment. But as an attorney, as a former attorney, I knew that I had to invest it with something um, more substantial than that because I didn't want it. I didn't want it to be wacky. And it had the potential to be that. And I wanted it to be something totally quite different. I wanted to take that crazy world building quite seriously and, um, and, and create a world where all of us would feel like foreigners in some way to give everybody the immigrant experience of entering into a world where things that seem ridiculous are part of ingrained in their culture and to come and see this is not ridiculous this is this is this is awesome and beautiful and rich and so for that reason i did a whole lot of research about figure skating and kung fu and i had never to answer your question never done kung fu or figure skating but in the interest of research i took figure skating and kung fu lessons mm-hmm. and um and that was a, 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 a how did a, that go it <laughs> was very 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 sad actually it was an appalling experience i was so bad at both of those sports. My skills were so poor, it was comical. And it was frustrating for the longest time. While I was while I was actually taking those sports as research for the couple of months I was doing that, it was intensely frustrating and humiliating because I I'm a confident guy and I came in and I thought, okay, well how hard can this be? Famous last words. And <laughs> I, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm in good shape. I can do this. I've learned different sports before. I can do this. And in figure skating, in ice skating, I'm not even going to talk about figure skating. Let's talk about ice skating because I never got to the point of being able to do anything besides try to stand up. I literally was on my butt every other class. And these young kids who – young kids and, um, and young women were swimming around me like minnows in water on their skates just zipping by effortlessly. And I was constantly falling and getting injured. I was literally on my butt every class. And it was very frustrating. I didn't understand what was happening at first. Same thing was happening in Kung Fu class at the same time. I was consistently paired with a young woman who was um, probably all of 85 pounds and 19 years old. And and I thought, I, I could bench press you with one arm. But she was kicking my butt at every exercise that we were assigned. And I was, again, literally on my butt on the mat in every class. I didn't understand what was happening until I f- stepped back, um, swallowed some of my pride, and realized that I had plucked these two sports out of the air randomly because I thought they would, they would be fun to combine. But I had happened to pick two sports that reward balance and flexibility far more than brute strength and reward the ways that bodies are different. In these two sports, being small was not a disadvantage. It was actually a great advantage. And there were things that these young kids and young women could do that 
I, as a grown man, was not able to do, or at least could not do with trem tremendous effort. These were two sports that were made for th the ways that bodies were built differently from mine. And that actually broke the book open for me because I realized that I was writing a kid power and girl power story. At its heart, that's what the subtext was. So one of the main themes of the books became how seeming disadvantage is merely advantage turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was my experience with researching this topic that I had put together just on a lark for my own amusement and how I, I pulled an important and humbling life lesson for myself out of that. Yeah, I'm really glad that you picked uh, two sports that really um, like Asian Americans yeah. and Asians yeah. excel in. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I, I mean, like. I, I could never figure skate or do kung fu, but like there are so many Asians with that body type, yeah. and um, there have been so many great Asian Asian American figure skaters. Like right now, Yuzuru Hanyu, uh, oh Nathan gosh, Chen, yeah. Karen yeah. Chen, yeah. yeah, and of course, like, Shib Sibs, Shib Sibs, uh, <laughs> Michelle Kwan, Christy Yamaguchi, like. Uh, so many great Asian um, figure skaters in history. Actually, Midori Ito is the first uh, mm -hmm. uh, first woman to ever land a triple axel, and mm -hmm. she's Japanese. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just it was just really great because it came from like like you couldn't help but put Asian representation yeah. because of those two sports, and it was uh, like it just brought me so much joy as someone who loves figure skating and um, and like some of my favorite figure skaters are are Asian like Yuzuru Hanyu like immediately I thought of Seimei mm -hmm. uh, his free skate program mm -hmm. because uh, he kind of combines martial arts with uh, with grace and. Uh, I was really excited because you introduced those uh, two things and into uh, such a great uh, form of entertainment. Of course, when I was reading it, reading your book, I I thought this is impossible, but but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's nice to like picture all these badass moves, but it's just like in in my head, I'm like, oh, the physics. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. The, I took figure skating, not and and kung fu, not as technical research, but as stylistic research. Um, there, there, what I was going, what I wanted to create, well, I was creating a world that had no magic. I specifically wanted to create a fantasy that had no magic, but that showed how culture and history and athletics could be as cool as any magic. And so I was, I know I, I wanted to take some liberties with physics, the way that, that, um, wuxia novels and, and movies do, and the way that manga and anime does, mm -hmm. because that also felt quite, quite, um, authentically Asian to me. Oh, yeah. Uh, there is, you know, it's an interesting thing. The the relationship between fantasy and literature or or culture generally in Asian culture is is something that I drew upon. Because if you look back at if you look back at Chinese classics, there's there's an element of fantasy in so many of these Chinese classics. And the great emperors were military leaders that had you know, almost pseudo paranormal abilities to to uh, to prevail on the battlefield. And so there is this element of fantasy that we have in the West to some extent, like the the Arthurian legend. But in recent centuries, there's been this divide between history and um, and fantasy and uh, uh, realistic literature and speculative literature. And I saw throughout my research into Asian culture that there wasn't such a clear divide. And so I kind of wanted to lean into that. This is a, this was a world without flat out magic, but the world itself had things that were exaggerations of the mm -hmm. physics that we know. Um, and so, yeah, I I. I specifically wanted to research what it felt like to be on the ice, what it felt like to be doing Kung Fu. And, and I got some idea of it, not because I wanted to replicate any of those moves and not because I actually know what all those moves look, look like, but I wanted to evoke these forms that we had all seen on TV or in films and have the reader participate by creating an evocative name for a move, like the Riven Crane Split Jump, um, you know, or 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 um, you know, two kingfishers resting on a pine in an, in an autumn gust, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and then have the reader participate by mixing the moves because we've already fed enough specific moves in kung fu and figure skating, and those are two forms that have a family resemblance. That is, I think, why people have this immediate reaction when they hear kung fu figure skating. They hear that audible click in their minds that these things belong together, and so that was my way of 
carving out a space for the reader to fill in what nobody has ever seen before, really. And um, we just evoke and then let our knowledge of what these things look like create the mix. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, one of my favorite things about reading your book was reading the action scenes, because uh, even though I know that the physics are impossible, I could definitely see it happening. And uh, a part of me was just like, I wish like this gets adapted into an animated series, because that would be so great to like see these moves uh, come to life. Um, but we were talking earlier about how you wrote stories uh, before you wrote Peace Sprout, Chen and how it's set in the same world. It was for the Clarion uh, workshop. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, that was actually how I jump started my career. I was uh, 42 years old and I was working in the art industry as an art dealer and, uh, and a gallerist. And I just looked around me one day, looked in the mirror, looked, looked at my receding hairline and said, dude, you are 42 years old. You have always wanted to be a writer. You have done nothing about it. And um, and these years that tick away, they never come back. So kick this into high gear. And that was in, I think, February of 2012. And so I just quickly, I just quickly said, okay, well, what kind of writing do you like? I was trying to orient myself in how one starts to be a writer. And my favorite writer was Ted Chang. And I said, well, what kind of... What kind of work does Ted Chang write? Well, I guess he technically writes science fiction and fantasy, although he, his work is so um, transcendental, it, it it kind of is beyond genres. But if I had to categorize it, it would be science fiction and fantasy. And so I, I looked and I said, well, how do you get – how do you start a science fiction and fantasy career? And I saw that he had gone to – Clarion West or a Clarion before uh, there was Clarion West. He had gone to Clarion. I said, well, what's that? And I looked it up and I found out that there were these prestigious science fiction and fantasy writing workshops and that the deadline was two weeks away and they needed a writing sample. Wow. So luckily I had been thinking about Kung Fu figure skating in this world and I madly dashed off a little, uh, you know, a little uh, sample. And um, and I got in, and then that sample actually ended up being the first three chapters of Peace Sprout Chen. So um, I think that that world was very ready to be born. And then when I got there, uh, two of my instructors, three of my instructors, were very very uh, instrumental in giving me encouragement and giving me pointers to uh, on where where I needed to lean in this story and. Uh, the first one was Kelly Link. And actually, she was helpful because she wasn't helpful. When she read those <laughs> chapters, she said, this is, there is not one misstep in this. You need to pursue this. And so that was the affirmation that I needed. <laughs> um, and George R. R. Martin was, was fantastic. Um, I wrote a story called The Great Leap of Shin, which is a, which is history to the characters in Peace Sprout Chin, uh, about, um, the conflict between the two countries. And, um, and just for those, for the listeners that don't know it, it's about, uh, a eunuch in something like the equivalent of, uh, Imperial China who devises a grand engineering project to, to schedule a great earthquake when everybody could be warned to be outside of buildings so that even though the infrastructure of their country would be decimated, nobody would die. So he was trying to save all of the people of their country from um, from from dying in an earthquake. And uh, it was this grand, wacky engineering plan. But it was also this logic experiment. And, and I knew that if I wanted to create world building like that, um, I needed – to study the works of great world builders. And so I wrote that story specifically for George R. R. Martin. But when I worked on it with him and he gave me feedback, what he gave me was a – the most helpful thing he gave me was a character observation and it was not a world building observation. Because he actually said, you know, world building, I, I totally buy this. Um, and so that was the affirmation I needed on the world building. But um, – what he said to me was that there is nothing worth writing about but the human heart in conflict with itself. And, and, I, and I leaned hard into that with the Peace Sprout books, um, especially because it is, it is an immigrant story and her sense of belonging and her sense of um, cultural identity is divided or not, – not divided. It's, um, it's dual in nature. And so the idea of the heart in conflict with itself is everywhere throughout these books. And that's been this incredibly fruitful um, source of inspiration for me as a writer. And then the, the, the final instructor, Claren West, that helped me was Chuck Polinick. 
And I wrote, um, I wrote another story set in the world that is told from the viewpoint of the villain in Peace Brow Chen, Suki. And that was an exercise in voice because I think that, I think that writing outside of your, not your life experience, um, not in terms of representation, but writing outside of your personality type is an exercise in empathy to write from the viewpoint of a personality that you find quite odious and to make that entertaining and engaging and to keep the reader there uh, for the en entirety of the story, that requires some serious storytelling magic that requires in turn some deep empathy. And, and Chuck Palahniuk is a master of voice. So I wanted to try my powers of ventriloquism by writing something that was very far outside of my um, my own personality. So I wrote it from the viewpoint of this truly nasty mean girl. And I am a sweet, loving person. So it was <laughs> hard to write from let, that viewpoint. Let me just say, I loved Suki. I, <laughs> I love villains who are just so despicable yeah. in books. And you, you wrote such like interesting female characters. And I was actually very impressed because you. you're not, you. you're not <laughs> A woman and it was it was just so nice because it your book promoted empathy like you said it's an immigrant story and it's about um, i mean like even if your readers aren't immigrants and they're not from an immigrant family they can definitely put their uh put themselves in peace sprout chen's uh place because everyone feels out of place sometimes and everybody knows what it feels like to be an outsider and even if they're not bullied like you you can really um, you can really understand where Peace Brow Chen is coming from and her feelings. And uh, I really, really appreciate that uh, with your writing. So um, thank you. Yeah. Th <laughs> thank I take you. that as a huge compliment. I was, um, I, I felt a great deal of um, responsibility taking on the voice of a female character because I do not identify as female and I believe very much in. I believe very much in good representation because I think it not only makes for better people and better society, but it makes for better books. And so I thought very, very hard about all the people that who had influenced me uh, as a child, as a person, as an adult, as a writer, and almost all of them were women. Um, my my agent, Tina Dubois, my editor, Tiff Liao, my sister, my kindergarten teacher, all of these people, they were women who who formed me. So I felt uh, I felt that this was my way to say thank you, and, but I wanted it to be not some sort of, you know, uh, obsequious thing. I wanted to say thank you by, sh by having good and convincing representation. And one of the things that I very early on seized upon was one, one easy trick to get good representation is to make – the character that belongs to that group, not the only character that belongs to that group in the story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she is not the only girl in um, in the book. In fact, almost all of the main characters are female. And it was a way to show that not all girls feel the same way. Not all girls have the same girlhood. Not everybody has the same experience just because they belong to the same group. And that also made the story just so much richer. To yeah. have to have those competing visions of what friendship looks like and what competition can look like, and to show not all girls feel the same way. Also, I really like cricket. Oh, I love yeah, cricket. Yeah, because he cricket. he's not like a manly man, you yeah. know. Like, and and he learns in in your book that like his size and. Um, and him not being like the best Wulu skater, like he still has uh, these advantages and he still has some value to him as a skater. And I think that's a really important message to uh, to young readers, especially young male readers who might not fit into uh, what we have, like what society's idea of masculinity is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, cricket for the readers, who, for the listeners who have not read the book yet. Cricket is the younger brother of the main character, Peace Sprout, and Peace Sprout is very protective and smothering to some extent. She loves her brother fiercely, but she had to raise him, and uh, he comes to her. He comes with her to the academy, and it's a very big pond, and so she thinks she has to do all of these things to prop him up so that he doesn't drown in this big pond. And it takes her a long time to realize, that, to realize that he's got his own way forward and it might be a better way than she could have ever thought of. And he is tremendously talented. Now, this is actually – we did I did a bit of gender reversal because in some ways Cricket was inspired by my sister 
And my sister is my older sister. But uh, I was always the loudest, um, most entertaining person in the room and growing up. And it took me a long time to realize that my sister has ideas that are as in, as creative as anything I will ever come up with. But the difference is that she's not screaming for attention the entire time. <laughs> and it took me a long time to to realize that. So um, I I poured I poured my memories of her and all those things that that she thought um, and that she cared about so so many decades before I. I, I woke up to um, being sensitive about them and, and pour them into cricket. And so the book is in some ways my way to say um, uh, thank you and I am sorry and I see you and I love you to oh my, my sister. God, that's, that's so sweet. Oh, my God. You're you're killing me with the sweetness. <laughs> Um, but you also have queer characters too, and I do. like that—that's great because you started it from book one and didn't introduce it in in, in book two, which we'll talk about uh, uh, later on. But yeah, like I, I I think about books like Harry Potter, for example, and like J.K. J.K. Rowling goes, "Oh, Dumbledore's gay," and I I as a reader ask, "Where is that in the book? Where where did you yeah. show it?" So it was really refreshing to just see it from the get go. Yeah, I. I love J.K. Rowling. I think she is a wonderful ally, and um, and I love that she is that she is trying to embrace diversity in in her public persona and in her work. I do feel that the retconning of diversity into Harry Potter is not the most graceful thing. I would have preferred to have seen some of this in the text, and I think it I think it would have made a difference to young readers um, who were looking for that kind of affirmation in the books. Uh, and that that is not a knock against J.K. Rowling at, at all. Oh I, no, I, I no, love not, her. not at all. I, I think I, it's also important to put put like the time period yes, that she wrote exactly, in into context. Exactly, exactly. Um, but I did very consciously have that in mind when I created the Peace About Chen series. I very deliberately wanted to create a, a diverse, queer, um, environmentally and animal rights conscious Harry Potter of my own. I wanted to create the the awakened Harry Potter that I had wanted Harry Potter to be in some ways. Not that I didn't love Harry Potter, but uh, but now I wanted to create something of my own that was that was progressive from the ground up, that had that baked into the fundamental recipe and that couldn't, you know, I don't, we can't talk about spoilers, but this is a plot that could not have happened without, um, without gay characters, without, without challenging gender, without all these things. The plot literally could not have happened. And I engineered it that way because I didn't want it to have a cosmetic veneer of diversity put onto it. Um, I wanted to create a plot that could only work with gay characters. And, I won't talk more about that because I'm venturing into spoiler territory. Mm-hmm. But I, I did that in part because I saw the resistance of the, the trolls who you know, were waving their pitchforks that Star Wars was being taken away from them and ruined and Harry Potter was being ruined for them. So I wanted to create something that had a Harry Potter feel um, without relying on any of the cosmetic trappings of Harry Potter. It had a Harry Potter feel but was also – diverse and progressive from the ground up so that the trolls could not complain that somebody had done a switcheroo on them. Um, you're on board with this material or, or, or not from the, from the outset. And also, of course, I wanted to give all sorts of kids um, a Harry Potter of their own. I wanted to give Taiwan a Harry Potter of its own. I wanted to give Asian kids. I wanted to give skaters. I wanted to give nerdy kids. I wanted to give queer kids. I wanted to give vegan kids a Harry Potter of their own. So that's very, that was very much in my mindset, building the story from the ground up. Yeah, I'm pretty sure like a decade from now, there will be uh, writers who say, oh, this is a Pea Sprout Chen of my own. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I feel like we're, wow. we're getting oh, there got, with, with Asian chills. American writers. <laughs> um, let's talk about your sequel, Pea Sprout, Ch- Pea Sprout Chen Battle of Champions. Yeah. So um, I would say like it gets into more serious territories because you like there is like a threat of war looming over over the con- uh, over the country. And you also have a new character uh, that you introduced. Yin Mei. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about her and uh, I guess like the premise of Battle of Champions for our listeners? Yeah. So in the first book, Peace Sprout finds her place at this academy. And uh, by the end of the first year there, she um, she realizes that this is not a perfect place, but she, she is happy there. And she feels like she is finding her footing underneath her. And in the the second book, 
the, the second year at the academy, something happens and that is that there is a very real threat that her homeland is going to invade her, invade her new home of, of Pearl. And so she is put in the position of so many immigrants throughout history, but particularly I had in mind Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, and, um, and she's put in the position of the, of the, of the young men who signed up for the 442nd. She is asked to come up with battle strategies in case there is a war with her homeland. And she is, she is, she is asked point blank, are you with them or are you with us? Are you still one of them or are you now one of us? And, um, the, the story was always going in this direction. There were hints of this in the first book, but it's come to a crisis now. And, uh, and Peace Sprout struggles with it because she, she will always be from her homeland, but she also belongs here now. And she doesn't understand why can't she be both? But history is not, uh, not allowing her to be both. War is, is forcing her to be one or the other. And into this comes, um, uh, an, another student named Yin Mei. And Yin Mei is fleeing from their homeland. Uh, she comes from the same country as Peace Sprout does, <clears throat> the Empire of Xin. She is fleeing because she claims that her great great grandmother, the Empress Dowager of Xin, has poisoned off all of the rest of their family, the royal family, and that she is the last in line. And she is seeking refuge here at this sanctuary school from the um, from the clutches of her great great grandmother, and. Peace Sprout does not believe that she is here as a refugee. There are indications that her story just doesn't check out. And um, there are things that Peace Sprout knows from her un unusual uh, relationship with the powers that be in their homeland. I mean, she was basically the equivalent of a gold medal skater. So she had access to information that others didn't. And she knows that this new student Yin Mei story does not check out. And everybody says, Peace Brought, you're wrong. Peace Brought, you're being prejudiced. And Peace Brought hates that she is suddenly in the ironic position of being prejudiced against something for coming, uh, prejudiced against someone just because they come from somewhere else, which is exactly the prejudice that she faced last year. <clears throat> so her heart is very divided in that way as well. And, um, what Yin Mei's real story is, is, is the central mystery of the second book, which I won't go into for um, obvious spoiler reasons. But the book, you know, it's interesting. I wanted to escalate the geopolitical tension. And here was the work with George R. R. Martin coming into play. And it, it starts to feel like a Game of Thrones because it, you know, it literally is a Game of Thrones with people vying for power. Um, and, um, and it played on this intimate stage of a school um, between these two girls that are suddenly thrust into history in a way that they didn't expect to be. And so the political part of it becomes um, higher stakes and more prominent. But I, I knew I had to leaven that with other things. So the action has to be more entertaining and better. And there has to ha have to be cool, interesting things that augment the action so that it's very different. So the action sequences in the second book are quite different. There are ve vehicles now that come in. I don't want to talk about the vehicles. Mm -hmm. And then there's music. And then on top of that, there's this rock band vibe, which is very much the soul of the second book. It is it is basically about a band coming together and coming apart. You know, the rise and fall of Nobody and the Fire Chickens really should be the subtitle of, of, mm -hmm. the, of the book. It's about that dynamic. Um, and the character arc was in the first book, it's about Peace Sprout learning to make a friend. Um, there is a theme song that I wrote for the book called the, the, the Pearly and New Year song. And one of the lines is, if I kept one friend, then the year has not been wasted. And that is Peace Sprout's arc in the first book, holding on to these one-on-one -on -one relationships because she's had to go it alone. So the first book is kind of about dance, about a duet, about two people dancing together together. Um, pulling apart, coming together. That's the that was the motif of the first book. The second book's motif is all about rock bands because they are a small but intimate, tight group of people that often have terrible conflicts and terrible and wonderful camaraderie along with the terrible conflicts. So that was the that was the um, 
the underlying theme of the of the second book tonally for me. But what that also does is it creates opportunities for a lot of fun and a lot of school drama and, and a lot of um, uh, a, a lot of the stuff that would lighten the darkening clouds that were gathering over the school. So I knew I had to make it more fun, more action packed because it was also more serious. So that was the balance that I needed to strike. Your books are very very funny. So thank you. <laughs> I think <laughs> so I crack myself up all the time. So it helps uh, balance the more serious elements. Um, <laughs> But uh, since you brought up music, yeah. you, like I, I first met you because uh, you were at my local bookstore and you performed a song. Romance because... Pasadena, the best bookstore. <laughs> so, uh, did were you always a musician, or was that something that just like? I am not a musician. Okay. <laughs> I am not a songwriter. I'm not a singer. I, I don't don't really know how to play any of these instruments. Um, you played a traditional instrument for the kids. It was it was a sanshin. Or? San, uh, yeah, sanshin in Japanese, sanshien in Mandarin. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is that I believe that enthusiasm makes the world go round, and that people, the world will forgive you a lot of shortcomings if you're enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of what gave me the. Um, the courage to do this. So what I do is I write theme songs that go with my books. There's at least one theme song with every book. Um, and the first book, the first piece, piece about Chen book, I wrote uh, a theme song. And the original thinking behind that was that I had spent so much time building up this world and the most granular details of the world were very unusual. I wanted to. Be, I wanted to not rely on. Um, I didn't want to be lazy. I wanted to create everything from the ground up. So that even the way that they deliver their newspaper headlines and their advertisements was unusual and true to the world, but unusual and completely different from ours. So because I had invested so much in that world building over 10 years time, I mean, I can close my eyes and that world resides in the same place in my, in my brain, literally in the same place in my brain where the memories of my, um, the, uh, my childhood home or my boarding school that I went to, um, reside in my brain. They're that vivid and they reside in the same place. And because of that, I wanted to create an artifact that I could share with people from that world. I couldn't create these skates. I couldn't create any of the vehicles from the second book. I couldn't create the buildings, but I could create a song. And the interesting thing about a song is that the song would be as as real and vivid in our world as in their world. It wouldn't be some sort of um, you know homemade paper mache uh, maquette of this thing. No, it would be as vivid as in their world. So I wanted to create a song for that reason, and I wanted to create a song that sounded like it could come from that world, but also wasn't um, 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 costume in its in its spirit. So it had some contemporary elements that just gave a sense of dislocation. So it's, it, 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 is, it, is, it is Chinese and Taiwanese, and it is also not Chinese and Taiwanese. So I created this song uh, through the magic of um, Apple GarageBand on my iPad. And uh, I was lucky enough that um, I had a contact through my agency to Adina Menzel, who, for those who, who don't know, is the star of uh, Frozen and Wicked and Rent and Glee. And she fell in love with the piece about Chen uh, first book. And... Um, I asked her if she would sing the theme song at my book book launch, and she did. So that was the start of me, of my shtick of doing theme songs for my books, and um, and I love it. I love, I love creating this artifact from the world, and I also love subverting expectations of what the world should be like. I um, I did not, you know, there's um, there are some things that I some some cliches of Asian stories that I very consciously wanted to buck in the Peace Brought Chen books. And one of them was the idea of humorless, self-sacrificing, uh, silently um, patient characters. No, these people, the, all the characters in my books, they have, they have feelings and you know what they're feeling all the time. And they're very expressive. And the idea, I realized that the idea of expression, the idea of um, – Asians or Asian Americans not being expressive and n being emotionless or and or humorless was something I vehemently disagreed with. And I wanted to show that by busting out with songs at my book launch. <laughs> so that was part of the reason as well. I wanted to show how no, whatever you have been told on that on that particular stereotype, um I that is not my experience. And let me show you, let me play you a song to show you that. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, like your characters are, are very loud and colorful. I love the teachers at the <laughs> school. Yeah, <that's> <laughs> uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's one of the teachers laugh. Um, very, very specific. But yeah, it's just like really funny because when Peace Sprout Chen first comes to uh, Pearl Famous, uh, like one of the teachers like, you guys know nothing. Yeah, you guys your skills are, are trash. Everything you have learned is trash. <laughs> it's just like, wow. Uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it's really a stereotype, but I was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm being reminded by, like, a lot of my uh, Korean school teachers. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. What, what you know is trash or yeah. worthless. You know, uh, that's actually one thing that my my editor um, pointed out to me that I was doing. My editor is, is Taiwanese-American as well. And... And uh, so we were able to have this, um, this, this, this rondelay back and forth about culture and our relationship with culture with these piece about Chen books. And what she pointed out was that I was not avoiding the stereotypes. I was picking them out, whether consciously or subconsciously, picking them out and, and, and just embracing them, saying, I am not afraid of you stereotype. I'm going to take you on. And then I, I'm going to show, I'm going to, I'm going to show love and humor and, and create something warm out of something that my, my, the first instinct might be to avoid. Instead of tippy-toeing around the stereotype, I'm going to say, I'm not afraid of the stereotype of the, of the tiger mother. I'm not afraid of the stereotype of, uh, of the super strict teacher. I'm going to, I'm going to lean hard into that and show I'm not afraid of it and, and show something fresh that comes out of it. Um, so it is not accentuating the stereotype. It is in fact exploding the stereotype, but to explode it, you have to first identify it. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, I, I feel like we're wrapping up, but, uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, do you have any advice for aspiring, uh, writers? And is there any, uh, books that you recommend? Oh, yeah. My favorite question. Um, of, regarding advice for aspiring writers. I would say fly your freak flag as high and proud as you possibly can. Um, that's what I did. I, I wrote the book that I wanted to read my whole life and could not find. And I did not care how weird it was because the thing is there are lots of good books and one way to distinguish yourself is writing just exactly the book that only you could have written and that you wanted to read by putting together all the things that you're interested in. Um, you just put together two or three things that are you, and then suddenly you have distinguished yourself from everybody else out there because there is no other exact you. So that would be my advice. Go with what you think is is individual and special about you, no matter how weird it is, because there's probably somebody else out there that's going to think it is beautiful. And regarding books to recommend, um, let's limit it. I mean, there's so many to recommend. Let's limit it to uh, books by authors of uh, Asian heritage uh, just to make it manageable. Well, as you mentioned before the before we started recording, Kelly Yang's front desk is, is – um, so resonant for so many people for a very, very good reason. And uh, so I would recommend Kelly Yang's Front Desk. It is a wonderful, um, heartfelt, and hopeful immigrant story. I would also recommend a book by a, a Filipino-American writer and illustrator artist named uh, Armand Baltazar. And the book is called Timeless, Diego and the Rangers of the Vast Atlantic. And it's an un unusual book because it's a middle grade novel, a full length middle grade novel, but it's filled with these luscious paintings that kind of, if you know Dinotopia, it kind of feels like Dinotopia. And the, the world building is very, um, is, is beautiful. It's that the, the art design is at the level of Star Wars. But what is interesting about the book conceptually is it, it's got a, a very fresh take on immigration in that it's about a cosmic event. Um, that mashes, mashes together two uh, different time periods. So instead of people from different continents coming together or only different continents coming together, it's people from different time periods coming together. So you've got people who are coming in with Victorian values, living next to, um, you know, young, young, diverse kids from Chicago and making friends and then asking questions about the values that their time period brings and realizing that those values are going to be in conflict. So what if you, you know, what if you're from Victorian England and you make a friend, you're, and your friend is, is black and, um, and your country that you came from, your time period that you came from treats black people in a very different way. <laughs> how do you, how do you, how do you reconcile your heritage with 
the, the 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 world that you want to live in. So it's really interesting in that way because it is mashing up not just different countries but different time periods and the values that come with them. And the artwork is just stunningly beautiful. Um, I would also recommend another recent book um, uh, by uh, Sean Tan, the um, the award winning and Oscar winning illustrator of The Arrival, and it's called Tales from the Inner City. And if people don't know Sean Tan, he is just a, a treasure. He is an, an absolute genius and a master and, and my favorite artist working in children's illustrated books today. Um, everything he does is filled with so much care and sensitivity. And I won't say anything more about his books except that when you read them, you feel loved. You feel that somebody – um has felt what you have felt in a way that is incredibly special. His books are so gentle and there is so much um there is so much love for for humanity and for animals in all of them and there's so much empathy and um and I told his um his former publisher Arthur Levine I said when I read a Sean Tan book at the end of it, I feel like I am slightly but permanently a better person. Ah. So that's the <laughs> best possible recommendation I think I can give of Sean Tan's books. Um, and then the other shout out goes to a, a new uh, co- co- um, a new collection coming out in May um, of Ted Chiang's stories. If you don't know Ted Chiang, you uh, you might have checked out the movie Arrival. Arrival was based on one of his short stories, and Ted Chiang only writes short fiction and. He's like a Kubrick. Everything he does is wildly different from everything else, and he just nails everything he tries. On the first attempt at a genre, he just nails it. Everything he produces is masterful. And his last collection came out maybe 15 years ago. The second one is coming out in May. So it's a major event in the science fiction and fantasy community. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Marvin, do you have anything to add or um, <laughs> say? <laughs> I think you covered everything. I'm I just sitting like... here listening to you both talk, and I'm 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 fine with that. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'll talk I just later. Steamrolled right. <laughs> no, so it's, sorry. It's cool. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thank you. Congratulations on the second book. Thank you. And uh, we've been talking to author Henry Lian the author of the Peace Sprout Chen series. Uh, so check it out at your local bookstore. Support local bookstores. Yay. Uh, and yeah, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> And that was Henry Lian, the author of the Peace Sprout Chen series. I was fascinated by the conversation so much that I forgot to ask questions. <laughs> I was hoping that you would ask questions since uh, you're also Taiwanese. And I don't know if you listeners um, noticed, but Rira is a really good interviewer, and she was on a roll. And she was, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> she was like, taking what he was giving her, and then moving on to the next question seamlessly. Um, you can tell she she's do this for a living. <laughs> no, not for a living, because otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I would get paid a lot. I I do this because I I love it, and I love talking to authors and. Uh, thank you again to Henry Lian for giving up his uh, time uh, to be yeah. on this podcast. It's always great to bring an author in studio with us, too. Um, yes, yes. It's definitely. great that Henry was local and um, always great to hear what how people become authors and where they come from. And, and it's, you know, it, it goes to show that it's never too late to do something you really love. Yes, yes. You do not have to be under 30 years old <laughs> and, and sell your first book before you're 30 in order to be successful. You can start writing in your 40s and, you know, be be okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> follow your dreams. Yeah. Uh, so, Rira, why don't you remind our listeners what our April Book Club pick is? Our April Book Club pick is Bangkok Wakes to Rain by Pichaya Sudbantad. And I am not sure if I pronounced uh, the author's name correctly, but I did my best. Yes. And um, you guys know the title of the book. So <laughs> we are going to talk about that at the end of April, hopefully. Uh, yeah. And that'll also do it for this week's episode of Books and Boba. Uh, don't forget, you can subscribe to us on Spotify, Google, Apple, or wherever you find your podcasts. Um, 
Thanks again to Visual Communications. Um, this podcast was recorded at the Visual Communications offices in downtown LA, which is also where the Potluck Podcast Studios is located. Uh, Visual Communications has a great event coming up in a few weeks called the Los Angeles Asian Pacific Film Festival. It's the biggest film festival for Asian Asian American films um, in Los Angeles. Um, there's a lot of great films premiering there. If you're in LA, please come check it out. You can learn more about BC and the festival by going to the website bcmedia.org. Thanks also to the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts that we're a part of. You can find and listen to all the great shows of the Potluck Collective by going to the website podcastpotluck.com. Shows such as The Clubcast, Fest Creatives, Asian Americana, and more. Again, check out the website podcastpotluck.com. And we will see you at the end of, not see you. You will you will hear from us at the end of April when we talk about our April book club pick. Thanks for listening. Bye everyone. Bye. Hey, I'm Bill Yu, and you may know me from a blog called Angry Asian Man. And I'm Jeff Yang, author, journalist, and celebrity dad. We host a podcast called They Call Us Bruce, an unfiltered conversation about what's happening in Asian America. Each week or so, we host a discussion about some of the most vital and interesting topics in our pop culture and our community, bringing in guests who are shaping and informing this thing called Asian America from Hollywood to D.C. and beyond. Uh, we got media, entertainment, food, family, politics, representation, the good, the bad, the WTF of it all. So check us out wherever you get your podcasts or at theycallsbruce.com. Peace. Peace.